All right, hello everyone. Uh, it is 10 o'clock, so we are gonna go ahead and get this started. Uh, if you have any questions or comments along the way, let me know through the text portion of Zoom. Uh, it also looks like we have hit a cap of 100 people and we have someone else trying to fix that, but this will be available as a recording, so everyone knows that. So let me introduce myself. I am Ryan North. I am the principal geophysicist at Olson Engineering. And I'm gonna do the introduction on this and help with some questions, but my colleague, Travis Nielsen, will be the person doing the bulk of the presenting. And the reason for that is that he has uh, many years of experience doing this exact topic. And so it wouldn't make any sense for me to uh, do all the talking when he's the person with more experience on this specific issue. Uh, as I said before, we will uh, make a recording available of this, but it'll be a little over a week at least before we do that because we want to take any comments or questions that you give us at the end of the talk and uh, address those in the presentation and then we'll re-record it and post it to our website and YouTube and LinkedIn and uh, any other locations. Uh, I think we've covered everything. If you have any problems with video or audio, again, please make a note in the text chat section. Other than that, I'm going to let Travis uh, go ahead and take the lead on the presentation, and I'm going to switch off my video, and you're going to start hearing him. All right. I'm going to assume everybody can hear me, but like Ryan said, my name is Travis Nielsen, a geophysicist with Olson Engineering. So what is site class? Um, site class is a classification schema developed by the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program, or NEHRP, that essentially attempts to classify soils based on their potential ground shaking application. It essentially breaks soils in classes A through E, and also F, but F is special. We will discuss that in a little bit, um, with A being hard rock with the lowest amplification and E being soft soils with the highest amplification. Site class can vary quite a bit geologically or with um, geographically in areas with a lot of geologic heterogeneity. This is a site class map of Olympia, Washington, where I used to live. These D slash E are, uh, or C slash Ds are areas where the site class is predicted to be either C or D. I used to live here. My office was about a mile away here. And within a mile of my house, there were three different potential site classes. Uh, not everywhere is as heterogeneous as Olympia, but I think this demonstrates that there is a value to doing um, site-specific site, site class measurements because a site class measured nearby does not necessarily apply to the site that you're working at now. So why do we care about site class? Why do we measure it? Um, the classic uh, example would be the 1985 Mexico City earthquake. The epicenter of the earthquake was 400 kilometers away from the center of Mexico City. Mexico City experienced some pretty extreme ground acceleration, 170, 170 centimeters per second squared, uh, which was a devastating earthquake for Mexico City. Paradoxically, the Tia Calco um, seismic station, which was closer to the epicenter at 332 kilometers, experienced virtually no ground acceleration, a very minimal ground acceleration. And why that is, is the soils that make up the Mexico City Basin. Mexico City was uh, built on a old lake bed. And as the seismic waves traveled from the epicenter through the bedrock, and encountered this basin, the slow velo seismic velocities of the lake bed has the, had the effect of amplifying the seismic wave amplitude, thereby increasing the damage. Um, uh, in comparison, Tia Calco was built on more solid soil, lower or higher velocity soil, so there wasn't that same um, ground shaking amplification. So we measure site class so we can design for specific risk. Designing for specific risk allows us to make sure our buildings are designed um, strong enough to prevent loss of life, but it also helps us prevent over-designing, which 
um, reduces construction costs and helps us reduce um, insurance costs as well. So what site class is specifically? It's a series of averages or param uh, averages of parameters over the top 30 meters or 100 feet. It can be the shear wave velocity for uh, the average shear wave velocity for each layer in the, uh, in the uh, upper 30 meters, or it can be the average penetration resistance for each layer in the upper uh, 30 meters, and the same thing for undrained shear strength. Like I mentioned, site class is A through E with F, F being a special site class um, for highly liquefiable soils, high organic con uh, content soils like peat, and soils with a lot of high plasticity clay. Uh, all site classes can be established with uh, shear wave velocity measurements, but not all site classes can be established with penetration resistance or undrained shear strength. So site classes A and B have to be established with shear wave velocity. And there are also special rules with site class A and B, which might allow you to not measure the site specific velocity, but the velocity of the formation underlying the site. C, D, and E, which make up the vast majority of site classes that you um, will encounter doing engineering work can be established by either uh, measuring the shear wave velocity, penetration resistance, or undrained shear strength. Site class E also has some special um, uh, special rules. If it has more than 10 feet of soil having any of these characteristics like high plasticity, moisture content, or low undrained shear strength, then it is automatically site class E regardless of these values. Um, since we're geophysicists, we're primarily going to be talking about the average shear wave velocity. So when we say average shear wave velocity, we usually uh, refer to a shorthand of VS30, so it's uh, shear wave velocity of the upper 30 meters, or VS100, which would be for the upper 100 feet. Uh, so how we would establish VS30 is we need to have a velocity model. This is a velocity model that from an MASW survey I did in um, Western Washington near Vancouver, Washington. This black line represents the shear, the, the shear wave velocity model. Each one of these blocks is a, uh, is a model layer. And we'll take this velocity model and use this equation to establish our VS30. In this case, it was 341 meters per second, which put it pretty well in site class D. There are also uh, remote ways of establishing site class. Um, the USGS has uh, created site class maps for the whole world by establishing a correlation between slope range and VS30. That's what this is with lower images here. Um, essentially, topographic flat topographies tend to have a lower VS30, so you can, you can um, approximate or remotely estimate VS30 for a large area. I'm going to show you what that looks like. So this is the USGS's um, portal for accessing their uh, VS30 information. They're essentially two data products. They have the topographic slope, which this takes a relatively low DEM that's available for the whole world and estimates it. And then they also have this VS30 mosaic, which incorporates um, higher resolution and also uh, some local site class measurements. But since high resolution DMs are not uh, uh, universally available, um, this doesn't, uh, this isn't, the VS30 mosaic isn't available for the whole world. And there are other non-site specific estimates, other GIS products that are available. These are usually regional, established by states. Or um, the example that I'm showing here is from, it was developed by the Washington Geologic Survey. Essentially how this one was made is they took the geologic units available or present at the surface all across Washington and they grouped them. So they grouped alluvium together, they grouped uh, certain types of glacial units together, 
and they established a VS30 range for each one of these group units, and then use the geologic maps for the whole state to estimate site class for the whole state. Um, in my previous job, I actually tested this uh, site class map against 100 manually measured VS30 measurements. I found it to be accurate about 80% of the time, which you know, for something that's freely available is pretty good. These are still not a replacement for site-specific measurements, but I think they're a really good way to understand what you might want to do when approaching a new site. Because um, it can provide information on what on the geology and what what the likely site class is going to be. Okay, so all VS30 measurements are measured using um, seismic methods. So before we go any further, I want to um, do a quick review of seismic waves. So seismic waves can be broken up into body waves, which are P waves and S waves. P waves have a particle motion that's in the direction of propagation. S waves have a particle motion that's per uh, perpendicular uh, to the direction of propagation. And we also have sur surface waves such as Rayleigh waves and love waves. Surface waves propagate parallel to the surface and they're caused by body wave interference patterns. Um, most methods, most surface seismic methods for measuring the VS30 usually use Rayleigh waves. That's a love wave. So Rayleigh waves, this one. Rayleigh waves have a retrograde elliptical motion and then love waves, which have a uh, particle motion that's parallel to the surface, but perpendicular to the direction of propagation. You can actually measure VS30 with love waves, but it's pretty difficult because generating um, low amplitude love waves is, uh, is not an easy task. So what does seismic waves look like in data? So this is what we would call a shot break. Essentially, I hit the ground here, and I recorded the ground motion with vertical component geophones. Because we're looking at vertical component geophones, we're only going to see P waves and Rayleigh waves. One nice thing about shot breaks um, is that it separates the body waves from the surface waves. Now we have a body wave window. This is where we're going to see reflected and refracted waves. And we also have a surface wave window where we'll see Rayleigh waves. Um, and if we had a horizontal component, um, survey love waves. There are actually going to be body waves in heat in the surface wave window, but their amplitude is so much lower than surface waves that they just tend to be swamped out. So now going on to uh, geophysical methods for measuring VS30. There are quite a few options for measuring VS30, and most of them work pretty well. They all will work in certain environments, and we'll go through all of the methods. Um, they can loosely be broken up into borehole methods, such as doing a VST or RVST, crosshole methods, and then surface seismic methods like MASW, REMI, S wave refraction, and um, H over V methods. So, vertical seismic profiling is uh, also called downhole seismic, the downhole seismic method. Um, essentially, it's a method where you lower a three-component geophone to your target depth or bottom of your well or borehole, and then you hit the ground at the surface and you measure the travel time it takes for the seismic wave generated by your surface source to, to reach your geophone. And then from that, using the uh, geophone depth and off source offset from the borehole, you measure an interval velocity. You then move the geophone up and then do this measurement again. This allows you to create a, uh, a series of interval velocities and then um, calculate a v, uh, shear wave or a velocity profile. So since VS30 um, is a measure of shear wave velocity, we have to be careful on how we hit the ground. Swinging a sledgehammer directly at ground in a vertical impact will primarily create P waves. Um, since we're interested in shear waves, we have to impart some sort of left or right motion into the ground. 
So there's a couple different ways of doing this. The simplest is to buy a beam of wood, park a truck on top of it, hit the side of the beam. There are more complicated uh, methods, such as using what we would call a shear beam. A shear beam is essentially a piece of wood that has some way of coupling to the ground. This one has spikes that you drive into the ground. I've seen ones with cleats. Um, these one, this one also has metal plates to increase its durability. And they're also much more complicated ones. Like this is a, what we call an automatic weight drop. It's been put at an angle, so it part imparts left or right motion into the ground. Um, there's also what we'd call a reverse seismic profile, or RVSP. So rather than putting the source at the surface and the geophone at the bottom, what we can do is put the source in the borehole and put an array of geophones at the top. This has some advantages because you can use an array of geophones, you can get some uh, estimate of your lateral velocity. So you can measure the interval of travel time from, or interval of velocity from here to here rather than just have one. But you do need to use a downhole source, which is more expensive than a four by four beam. So this is an example of a downhole source that uh, our sister company, Olson Instruments, makes. There are three pistons inside the source, which can impart. Uh, directional motion into the ground. There are also other ones like this. This is a shear wave sparker source. Um, so cross hole seismic surveys are the other downhole method. Um, essentially with a cross hole survey, you're gonna put your source in one borehole and you're gonna put your receiver in another borehole, another two boreholes. And you're gonna vary your source and receiver uh, depth and at each depth, you're going to measure the velocity in, uh, in between the boreholes. This is the most accurate way to measure your VS profile, but it's also uh, the most expensive because you need multiple boreholes. One advantage is if you vary your borehole or your source and receiver position in the borehole enough, you can actually produce a um, velocity tomogram. And this will provide full 2D information of your velocity profile. So if you suspect something like voids or a lot of ladder heterogeneity, this might be the way to go. Now we're gonna move on to the uh, seismic array methods, the surface seismic methods. And I just wanna go over quickly the equipment that we use for this. The backbone of the surface seismic array methods is the geophone, essentially a ground motion sensor with either a spike or a plate on it. Use the plate if you wanna do it on pavement use the spike if you want to um, drive it into the ground. And the other piece of equipment that you need is um, some sort of seismograph. This is a geode, 24 channel seismograph. Uh, this is an image of a seismic array I set up in central Washington. You can see some of the individual geophones, a little bit hard to see, and then the cable connecting all of them. There's also another type of seismic array called a land streamer. Essentially, a land streamer is when you put a geophone onto a metal plate, uh, and then you attach the metal plates to a uh, piece of webbing. And this is the advantage that you can move the whole array pretty easily. Uh, you can tow the array behind a, uh, a vehicle this, or like a side-by-side. The other added advantage is, uh, hold on, I'm just gonna. Ah, the other advantage is that you can use an automatic weight drop pretty easily because you can just mount it onto the vehicle. You don't have to use a vehicle based, um, you don't have to use a vehicle based land streamer array. You can also pull them by hand. You can also, put multiple land streamer arrays in parallel to each other so you can get some uh, lateral variability information, not just have a 2D profile. Uh, there's also two types of sources. There's active and passive seismic sources. Uh, active sources, the most common active source is a person hitting the ground with a sledgehammer. Uh, and that you can also have things like this. This is an automatic weight drop essentially lifts up a very heavy hammer and forces it into the ground. 
or, autom or accelerated waste drop, not automatic. They are automatic though. Uh, how this works is we have this hammer here that's lifted up by this chain, chain drive. And as it's lifted up, it tensions these bands. Uh, the advantage is pretty obvious. You know, this is a 23 kilogram weight. I can't swing a 23 kilogram hammer. Um, and it can also uh, accelerate it into the ground much faster than I can. Um, I estimate that I can swing a hammer at about two, maybe three meters per second. This one pretty consistently does four and a half meters per second. The other type of seismic source is passive seismic. There's a lot of ambient seismic waves generated by trains and semi-trucks as they travel along the road um, and hit bumps. Why you would be interested in using passive seismic is simply that the energy that a truck hitting a bump and parts into the ground is orders of magnitude more than even the largest accelerated weight drop. There are complications to using seismic sources and doing pass or passive seismic sources and doing passive seismic surveys, which we'll get on get into in a little bit. Um, so what does active and passive seismic data look like? So this is the same seismic active seismic data set I showed previously. You can see where it hit the ground, and you can see the seismic waves coming out. This is a passive seismic uh, data set that I gathered. And it doesn't, you can't really tell what's going on from just passive seismic data. Like this packet right here is probably surface waves coming through, but it's really, you know, hard to tell. The other difference between active and passive data is this shot record is half a second. This one is 30 seconds. I'll usually gather at least 20 of these. So you end up uh, gathering a lot more data in terms of time with uh, passive. So now onto the uh, first um, surface array method, which is the multi-channel analysis of surface waves or MASW. So MASW relies on the dispersive characteristics of surface waves. Uh, Longer wavelength, low frequency surface waves travel deeper into the subsurface, and therefore their velocity is uh, influenced by the deeper velocity structure. And we can use this relationship between frequency and velocity to produce um, mo uh, subsurface models. And an MASW array is pretty straightforward. You have a series of receivers or geophones, and you hit the ground in line with a sledgehammer. Active MASW processing uh, follows a pretty routine uh, procedure. You take your raw data, and then you either crop out your surface wave window, or you take the whole raw data set and do what's called a phase shift transform. The phase shift transform takes it from the time distance domain and transforms it into the phase velocity frequency domain. Each one of these uh, high coherence bands is a different mode of the surface wave. Surface waves, like a string that you vibrate, have multiple modes. You have the fundamental mode and you have second modes or higher modes. Um, most MASW processing re requires that you pick the fundamental mode. And if you pick the higher mode, you'll get erroneous data. The fundamental mode is always also the it's usually the highest coherence and it's always the lowest phase velocity for a given frequency. There are some MASW algorithms that uh, use higher modes, but they're not super common in industry at this point because predicting when a higher mode is going to be, uh, higher mode coherence is really site dependent. So some sites you're not gonna have a very coherent higher mode and some sites you're going to have a really coherent higher mode. You also need to be very careful when, if you can, to make sure that you can identify the right higher mode, whether this is the first higher mode or, or this is the first higher mode. But so once we've picked the um, the center of the fundamental mode, which we would call a dispersion curve, we can plot it like this. So this is the center of the fundamental mode from this image here. And you can see at lower frequencies, the velocity is increasing. So once we have this dispersion curve, we can start making um, subsurface models. 
So the first subsurface model we'll make would be with what we call the one third wavelength approximation. So essentially that one third, uh, the wavelength at, at a, of a pick is going to equal the depth. So this way we can now have a depth and velocity profile. The one third wavelength approximation is far from perfect. And how we improve this is through a process called inversion. The first step of inversion is to create an initial model. And we'll create this initial model, or we'll use the initial model from the one, one third wavelength. The second step is you want to model, a, you want to use this uh, initial model and simulate a seismic survey on it, and then pick, and then automatically pick a dispersion curve and compare your modeled and real dispersion curve and use those differences uh, to update your velocity model. And you do this iteratively uh, up to a dozen times, sometimes even more. And then eventually you arrive at certain criteria that you will say is good enough and you'll say that's your final velocity model. You can see the velocities have changed a little bit in this example. Now that you have this velocity model, then getting your VS30 is pretty straightforward. Log it in as the equation I showed earlier, get a VS30, in this case 321, and now you have your site class D. There are circumstances where you might need multiple uh, VS30 measurements or just a 2D VS profile. And there are a couple ways to do this. Conceptually, the easiest is to use a land streamer where you're moving the seismic array. Uh, when you do MASW processing, you assume that your 1D profile is at the center of the array. And so as you move the array, you're going to create a series of 1D profiles that uh, can then be interpolated together. So this is what we'll call, this is what we call a shot receiver map. Each one of these lines is a shot and the black dot on each line is the receiver location for the shot and the blue star is the shot location for the shot. So you can see every shot is at a different location. So every time we process one of these shots, the 1D profile is going to be different. And so we can interpolate that together to get a nice 2D uh, velocity profile. Now you can't always use a land streamer and you can do 2D MASW processing with a fixed array. So another shot receiver map. Um, this time you can see in between the shots, the arrays the position of the geophones is not changing, but the position of the shot is changing. So how we would do 2D MASW with a fixed receiver array is rather than process, doing MASW processing on every receiver, we'll use a subset. And so we'll have our shot receiver map like this. We've essentially um, deleted the data in the shots for everything other than a small subset. Now we're gonna get 1D profiles here, 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 and here. Uh, one key thing to note is generally when you do MASW is the more, the larger your array, the deeper you're gonna sample, but also the, um, if you have really large arrays then you're gonna have poor lateral resolution. So you have to balance that. So now with this shot receiver uh, map, we can do the MA, active MASW processing and get a 2D shear wave velocity profile. So, like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of, there, there uh, ambient seismic waves can be really high energy and really low frequency, but they can be tricky to use. So in an active survey, we can control where the shot location is going to be. And that allows us to use what's called a plane wave assumption. So by having the shot in line with the receiver array, we can assume that the waves are planar and not they don't have cylindrical spreading. Um, if you have, but when you're doing a uh, passive survey, you don't know where your shots are going to be and where they're going to come from. So you can have your, uh, even if you're using a planar wave assumption, they can be off angle. So traditionally, how you overcome this is you use a 2D receiver array. Either you range your geophones in a circle, a cross, square, triangle, really any semi-symmetric um, arrangement of geophones will work. And then what you'll do is you'll scan through all the azimuths, calculating the velocity, or sorry, you'll 
scan through the osmosis, assuming that the source is at that particular azimuth and calculate the velocity and sum that for each, and you'll do this for each frequency, and you'll sum that together, and that way you can create a dispersion curve. Um, now we have more sophisticated algorithms that can more accurately locate both the orientation and distance of the uh, passive shots. And with some clever processing, we can now correct for the cylindrical waves. And this allows us to use a linear, if we're careful, this allows us to use linear arrays to do passive MASW, which uh, reduces um, the burden of having to find a spot to do a 2D array. And there are ways that you can maximize the effectiveness of your linear passive array. And the easiest one to do um, is just to swing the sledgehammer once at the beginning of your survey. This is what I did here. This is a 30 second record gathered, but I cropped it off so you can see this is where I hit the ground. You can see the active surface waves coming through. Uh, and this will vastly improve your, uh, your dispersion image. So this is the dispersion image at the same location where I just gathered 10 minutes of passive data and I didn't swing the sledgehammer at all. This is that same location where now I only gathered two and a half minutes of passive data and I swung the sledgehammer five times, those two and a half minutes. And you can see in comparison, the fundamental mode is much clearer. Here it tapers off at maybe 16 or 17 hertz. You can't really take as much confidence below that. And down here, you can probably get down to 13 hertz. And for, give, for how little effort that was, it's a pretty, uh, pretty good improvement in data quality. So another uh, passive surface array method is called the microtremor array measurement. It's also called the microtremor survey method sometimes, or sometimes it's called the spatial autocorrelation method. They all use, they're all the same thing, and it all uses what's called the spatial autocorrelation algorithm, which was developed in 1957. So it's a pretty old method. It wasn't necessarily used in 1957, but the algorithm was developed back then. Um, it uses a stochastic source location, so it doesn't attempt to locate where the source is. But because of that, um, the original SPAC algorithm requires that you have a 2D array. Uh, Improvements in SPAC have, uh, improvements in the SPAC algorithm, come, sometimes called M-SPAC, or I think there's another one called E-SPAC, have improved the processing quite a bit. So now you can, then they show that you can do um, an MAM survey with just two risk stations, uh, as long as you're primarily focused on, on frequencies below five hertz. And I've used uh, modified SPAC algorithms uh, quite a bit with linear MASW arrays. And I found that they work really well most of the time, but they will occasionally throw uh, erroneous data that you won't be able to tell is real or fake unless you do an MASW or an active MASW gathered along with it, which is um, not a great increase in your labor. If you have a linear MASW array set up, do a couple of shots and then also do your MAM uh, data gather. Uh, and that way you can use MAM with a lot more confidence. So processing MAM data is pretty straightforward. You take your raw data, and then you do what's called the uh, a spatial autocorrelation or SPAC transform. This produces, it, uh, this produces a dispersion image just like in the, um, just like in the active MASW. You can see the dispersion image is, a, is a, the fundamental mode of the dispersion image is a lot less clear. That's a little bit site specific, but, um, and then after you've picked your dis, uh, dispersion curve or your fundamental mode, then you go through the same inversion process where you uh, create a velocity model and that from there you can um, calculate your VS30 insight class. So another surface array method is the refraction microtremor or Remy method. It uses the same equipment as MASW. And the name is a little uh, misleading. It's not looking at refracted microtremors. It's doing a microtremor survey with refraction equipment. Um, it was developed as a passive uh, 1DVS method 
by John Louie. And the, the goal was to use refraction equipment to do this. Uh, it's owned by the state of Nevada and only Optum of Reno has rights to distribute it. So processing Remy data is similar to processing um, active or passive or MAM data. You take your raw data and you do what's called a Cal P transform. But rather than picking the, uh, the center of your coherence band, you're going to pick the steepest descent point between your uh, maximum and your background noise. And then from this, you create a uh, VS model. Remy works really well in urban areas. It works really well with noise. It's a really low labor uh, method. You just have to set up your array, swing the sledgehammer or drive your car up, up and down the array. The downside is the dispersion image is difficult to pick and there's not exactly an established criteria for where to pick. Um, so the algorithm, the manual for Remy says you wanna pick the lowest energy bound but there's a lot of papers that say that you want to pick the steepest descent. Um, and this frustrated a colleague of mine, Zhang Bozhu. He did a comparison of Remy to uh, seismic interferometry. Um, and because they're having a hard time knowing where to pick, what they did was they picked the steepest descent algorithmically, and then they also picked the maximum so they could do a comparison of range. Uh, it's also prone to artifacts um, because it has a left to right processing algorithm. If you've got seismic waves coming in the wrong direction, which is going to be almost always, you're going to get bands like this. Uh, and you do need passive sources in, to be in line, but that's really easy to overcome by swinging your sledgehammer around, driving up and down. Uh, and there's only one option for software for Remy, and that's size opt Remy. Right, the last surface array method I'll talk about is S-wave refraction. Um, S-wave refraction procedurally is almost identical to P-wave refraction. You set up an array of geophones, you hit the ground, and then you're, you're going to be looking at the direct arrivals and the waves that travel down along a velocity interface then back up. The difference in S-wave refraction and P-wave refraction is the equipment that you use. You have to use some sort of shear source, like a beam with a car parked on it or this cleat-like thing that looks a little dangerous to use or something like this, another uh, cantilevered accelerated weight drop. And you have to use horizontally polarized geophones like this one rather than vertically polarized geophones. One nice thing is that you can do S-wave tomography using P-wave or software designed for P-wave tomography, so you don't have to duplicate uh, the software that you buy. The biggest downside is that if you're going to do S-wave refraction tomography, you need to have a very big array. A rule of thumb is that your sample depth is a fifth of your array length. So if you're trying to sample down to 30 meters, that means you need a 150 meter array. Uh, but that's way using that's way refraction with the tr traditional um, slope intercept method where you look at the slopes of the refractors and the, their intercepts to generate a model is was widely used before the advent of uh, Remy and MASW and it works really well in areas where you have um, a relatively simple geology like a two or a three layer geology something like where you had alluvium over a bedrock and you're pretty confident the bedrock didn't vary too much and the alluvium didn't vary too much. So you can just find the velocity of the alluvium and the velocity and the depth of the bedrock layer and use that 2D uh, velocity model to generate your VS30. Uh, there are still circumstances where you might want to use S-wave refraction and those are being sites with a lot of topography. Both Remy and MASW require relatively flat sites. Um, so if you're in a site like if you're that with a lot of topography and there's no way to have a flat array, um, then you're not going to be able to use Remy or MASW without introducing a lot of error. So the last method I'm going to talk about um, is the horizontal to spectral 
horizontal to uh, vertical spectral ratio method or HVSR, um, more commonly called just H over V. H over V relies on low frequency three component geophones. Something like this is the Moho World Termino. This is kind of in the standard for doing H over V uh, measurements for a while now. And then more recently, the geometric Atom 3C. Nice thing about these is that they're, they're relatively portable and are all cheaper than buying a seismic array. And they can provide site specific VS30 with caveats, uh, but they can also provide some really uh, stratigraphic uh, information to um, pretty great depths, like down to 100 meters in some cases. The biggest difficulty or the biggest challenge with using these is the data interpretation. So H over V field procedure is pretty simple. You have a 30 minute recording window. So at each location that you're recording, you want to record for at least 30 minutes. If you shorten the window, you're going to reduce your maximum sampling depth. And you want to collect in a grid um, with spacings of several hundred meters. And you also need, especially in windy days, to avoid structures, trees, and buildings. Trees in particular produce a lot of seismic noise. Um, so on windy days, you really can't do very much uh, seismic. So H over V interpretation. So the theory behind H over V, or the process behind H over V, is you take the spectrum of the horizontal component, and you divide it by the spectrum of the vertical component. And if you have a velocity interface at some depth, that velocity interface is going to cause a residence in the vertical component and then cause a, uh, a spike in the H over V curve. And the center frequency of that spike or peak is going to be, um, it's going to correlate to the depth of that interface. So this figure here shows the H over V curve for at three different sites with um, varying depths of a uh, velocity interface. And you can see when the soil is relatively shallow at four meters, the resonance peak is pretty, a pretty high um, frequency. And as you move down to three, uh, 300 meters of sedimentary cover, that center peak is a pretty low frequency. You calculate the uh, interface depth using this equation, which is the velocity of the cover divided by four times the center frequency. So it does require that you have some knowledge of your cover velocity. Um, there are inversion algorithms that use love waves and Rayleigh waves to invert for, uh, create a shear wave velocity profile using H over V measurements, but they're not very well constrained. Um, and I would hesitate to just use H over V um, to measure VS30 with only one measurement. If you're using a variety of measurements, then you can help uh, then the inversion to be constrained a little bit. Uh, I like using H over V in sites where I know the geology really well. And I'm mostly just confirming what I think the site class is going to be. And if those sites are um, very, or, or, or very remote, like it's a five mile hike, uh, and no one wants to pay for a helicopter, then um, strap or putting a five pound Tremino is a lot more appealing than a 250 pound seismic array. And I also like using it in sites where I might only have one, it's a really big site, I might only have one spot where I can do an MASW measurement. And so what I would do is I would measure, take H over V measurements around the MASW array and then all across the site and then compare the H over V curves to help characterize the site heterogeneity. And that helps you decide whether the VS30 measurement at the MASW array is going to be applicable for the whole site. Another nice thing about these um, H over V instruments is that you can use them for MAM and MASW if you have enough of them. Um, and so this kind of concludes, or now we're approaching the end of the talk. So in conclusion, there are, uh, multiple ways of determining site class with geophysical methods. They will all work, um, and most of them work in most cases. We prefer MASW as a surface array method, but all surface array methods are generally like lower cost and have similar accuracy to borehole methods. 
Um, and then there's also the surface station methods. These are low cost and low uh, labor, but they can be difficult to interpret and have, will oftentimes have site constraints. These would be the MAM and H over V. We have the borehole seismic methods. These are the highest accuracy, but require a borehole, um, which can be a uh, constraint in a lot of sites. So there are a couple of resources that we really like. Um, MASW.com, which is Tune Park's website, is a really great resource for learning anything about MASW. The EPA archive on geophysics is a really good way to learn about older geophysical methods. And then GeoStuff has a really nice article on measuring downhole shear waves. Um, and before we open up to general questions, Donald Anderson of Jacobs um, sent us two questions beforehand that I uh, would like to answer. So the first question is that noisy sites, like along an active freeway, um, what, uh, what method would we recommend? Um, and what are the pros and cons of the various seismic methods? So active MASW is going to work really well in this. Because you're constraining your active source really well on active MASW, the offline sources caused by the ambient or caused by the seismic waves generated by the passing cars are going to come in at unrealistic velocities. There's going to be some uh, there's going to be there's going to be some smearing of your fun, fundamental mode in that case, but it's still going to be pretty easy to pick. Remy is going to work really well in this case. And if you're careful with your uh, passive processing you can also use passive MASW. The second question was, how, do we, how would we recommend characterizing shallow shear waves? So reliably characterizing the upper 10 to 15 feet. So this is actually um, pretty easy to do. What you will do is this essentially reduce your geophone spacing and get a smaller hammer. So masw.com has this really nice table that essentially breaks out your target depth and what geometries that you're going to use that, that they recommend using. So, uh, and one thing I would say is you can, even with a larger geometry, like an array that's meant to target down to 30 meters, why you oftentimes don't get good results for the upper uh, 10 or 15 feet is that your models layers are too big. So if you're breaking 30 meters or hundred feet into 10 layers, then your upper 10 feet, 10 or 15 feet might only be one or two layers. So if you process the data, so or if, if you process the inversion so that you're having a lot, uh, a lot of layers in your uh, upper 15 feet, then you can oftentimes just use a, uh, a standard array. You don't have to buy a smaller sledgehammer or have a really short array. Um, so going on to the questions that have been put on the group chat. One second. So first question is how many percent of time of the time uh, not clear. I don't really understand what you're asking. I know this question came in pretty early on. Uh, So the sample rate of the H over V is at least two milliseconds. Um, it depends on what instrument that you're using. Can you tell from raw data if you're, if you have the wrong acquisition set up? And the answer is sometimes. Um, if you have an array that has a bend in it, then the data is gonna look it's not going to look that weird. And if you have an array with a bend in it, then um, then your then your results are going to be erroneous, and you're not going to be able to tell. There's also cases where in passive where you can have a passive you you can gather passive data, and it'll have a really strong higher mode, and it'll swamp out the um, fundamental mode. You won't necessarily be able to tell unless you do. Um, uh, unless you do an active survey. 
But and so, yeah, in general, from your raw field data, it's, it, it depends on what acquisition parameter you set up wrong, whether you're going to be able to tell from the raw data. What is the correlation percentage for the USGS measurements, uh, terrain slope site to site classification versus site class measurements? I don't actually know what their accuracy is. Um, I imagine that is going to be a little bit geographic dependent. Uh, for example, can you tell from raw data if you have higher mode contamination? Not typically. Um, it is really, really hard to tell from just looking at surface waves what the subsurface is doing unless you've got something like a object that's going to create a backscatter. Can you do similar space reduction for other methods? Um, I don't know specifically for Remy. Uh, if you're looking at shallow seismic, you don't really want to be using passive methods. So, because um, the ambient seismic, seismic noise is going to be pretty low frequency. So while you could, yeah, so you don't, if you're looking for shallow, you really want to stick to active MASW and maybe Remy, I'd have to look into that. Uh, do you think a good approach for approaching VS30 profiles through H over V inversion from recorded earthquake signals? Um, I don't know. I, H over V is designed to use ambient seismic and particular ambient Rayleigh waves and love waves, so surface waves. And I would expect that wouldn't work very well just because um, you're not going to be able to guarantee that you have a, uh, ambient uh, surface waves if you're looking at a record uh, earthquake record signal. Uh, any solutions for a VSP for when a VSP cannot receive the signal? The soil is 100 standard penetration. Um, the only real solution would be to try to use a bigger source uh, or try to use a surface method. If you're not able to propagate uh, your seismic waves through the subsurface, um, vertically like that i yeah i don't think there's really a solution to that that i'm aware of i think the eq signal frequency would be inefficient um could you clarify that a little bit oh that's yeah the earthquake signal frequency would be yeah um yeah again i don't really know the answer to that one i would just say standard h over v processing is to use ambient Uh, so H over V for building codes. Uh, I know H over V is more commonly used in Europe where they've got limited space. I don't think, so you can get like site period response from H over V as well. Um, I don't think it's really acceptable to be using H over V, standalone H over V measurements for VS30. I don't know if that's in, um, enshrined in a building code but I would say um, uh, as a uh, geophysical professional, I wouldn't be comfortable just using H over V outside of a, uh, at, to establish VS30 outside of a handful of situations, like if I know the geology really well. Could you run downhole uh, source and a marine streamer? Um, you could, so I think what you're asking is, could you put a hydrophone array down a source or down a borehole and then also put the source down the same borehole. I mean, you could do that. I don't know if you would get any valuable information from it. You can do, I mean, it's really common to use a marine streamer and a source at the surface. Um, or if you're doing cross holes, have a marine streamer in one hole and the source at the, uh, at the other hole. Uh, the only downside is if you're using a marine streamer, um, you do have to have a borehole full of water, so you need to be pumping water into it um, or be below the water table, and that's not always a guarantee that you can be able to do that. Is the VS30 classification enough for construction 
engineering or do they need to go through site amplification factors? Um, that is a question I'm not familiar with. I know it is specific from city to city. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not super familiar with how the site classes are used in specific construction parameters. I'm not an engineer. Is there added value for using horizontal geophones instead of vertical geophones? So you can use, so there is such a thing as multi-channel analysis of love waves. It's not widely used. It's essentially MASW processing using love waves with slightly different um, parameters. One advantage of the love wave survey is that there are much less likely to have higher modes. The disadvantage is um, it is really, really hard to generate low amplitude or low frequency love waves uh, using an active source. I don't know if anybody's really looked at you doing passive love wave surveys. And there has been some uh, research in using um, horizontal geophones to mute out higher modes. Uh, Boise State has a really good research group that's working on that. Uh, and they've been able to vastly, or not vastly, but moderately improve their MASW data by using this type of, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a type of particle motion mute. Uh, building codes, for building codes, should shear wave velocity be based on the calculated from the ground surface level or calculated on the elevation of the basement level? I don't know. I think that's going to vary from location to location. I would suspect that unless your basement is several hundred or is several stories deep, you're probably going to be fine with working on the surface. How effective is CPT that is widely used in California? Um, I'm not an expert in CPT. I'm not a geotechnical engineer by any stretch of the imagination. But my understanding is that CPT is quite, uh, is pretty well established and um, is perfectly effective, just as effective as using the BS methods. It doesn't look like we have any more questions popping up right now. So what I was going to uh, request is if everyone who is online could please send us an email so we can keep track of everyone who is here and then that we can also make sure you're on our list when we post the video of this talk. Um, if you have any other questions or requests, again, please email us. Please send LinkedIn connection uh, to both of us because we want to know uh, everyone who uh, is interested in this topic. And then another request I have is, is we're trying to figure out what our future uh, series of webinars are. If you have a specific topic request uh, that we should cover, please send that to us. And if we see a topic is pretty popular, we will uh, put together a webinar on that specific topic. Uh, so again, thank you for everyone for attending. I, I think this went quite well and contact us with any questions or uh, other requests that you have. All right, thanks everyone for attending. This is the largest, uh, this is the uh, present, uh, this is the largest audience presentation I've ever given. So that's kind of exciting. All right, I'm posting on here, uh, somebody asked what address to send it to. Please uh, send emails to the addresses currently on screen.